Hello, 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 and welcome to this week's episode of Tracy's Tuesday Talks. I am super excited and honored to have a guest co-speaker, Stephen Cobrin, who really, really, truly has a heart and passion for serving people with the last act of love, which is life insurance. Um, I am your hostess, Tracy Latona with Golden Rose Financial Coaching, and I am going to just ask several questions of Stephen, maybe hear a story, potentially shed a tear or two as we dive into this topic that has a lot of confusion around it and just wanted to provide clarity to the viewer. So Stephen, thank you so much for joining. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you into the life insurance industry. Thank you, Tracy. And, and I have to tell you, it is my distinct pleasure to be here and I'm honored to be a guest. Um, I come from a life insurance family. My father, Leon Cobrin, a blessed memory, uh, ran a life insurance brokerage in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. He was a performer. He was um, a singer. He was an entertainer. He was in show business. Mm -hmm. And when he finally reached a point when he wanted to settle down and have a family, he went into life insurance. And I grew up in his agency. I was one of those little kids stuffing envelopes for his dad, <laughs> watching Chiller Theater on a Saturday night, getting paid a penny a piece for the envelopes and, <laughs> and babysitting my baby sister. <laughs> and I grew up in the, his life insurance agency. I was, I was there from grade school all the way through college. So life insurance is in my blood. And it, it really needs to be because, as you mentioned, it's a weird product. Nobody likes to think about dying. Very few people like to think about what happens to their family or their business afterwards. It's a, it's a hard thought in this culture. Um, but it's in my blood and I'm very used to it. Um, when I graduated college, I spent a good 10 years resisting getting into the business on a full time basis <laughs> and uh, worked for businesses and was an operations manager. And then uh, when I got downsized, I immediately entered the business in 1991 and have not looked back. Oh, I love it. I love it. So you've been doing this basically since you were itty bitty. <laughs> yeah, very much the case. And um, it's been to my full benefit because um, I understand that this is a people oriented business. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the the benefit of when I got into the business full time, I had the benefit of immediately getting involved in claims, meaning that I had clients who tragically died on me very quickly. I inherited them as policyholders and some of them died. And um, that's a um, an eye opening experience for somebody in this business because you see what is the value of a life insurance policy? Mm -hmm. And this is very early in my career. I showed up at, a, at the home of a grieving widow with a big fat check. And I remember she said, now I can go to Florida. And she wasn't like, it wasn't like, oh, I've been waiting to go to Florida all these years. But she knew her, her husband had, been, had, had become very ill very quickly. Mm -hmm. And she knew the end was coming and, and she wanted she wanted time to get her act together and she knew it would be a long time and going to Florida meant this was the place which you would heal and grieve so that's what she meant I understood that. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. let me tell you in, in a time like that when a family loses a, a, a spouse or a parent um, or sometimes a child um the family needs to go through a mourning period and so many people have their hand are ready to bill them you know mm -hmm. have their hand out for money i came in with a check in hand yeah and i saw firsthand the difference money makes for people to to keep their quality of life and to go through the natural process they need to get their life back which which and it needs a lot of time yeah that is a really touching story because the experience that we had in our family was the opposite. My father-in-law 
had a originally a $300,000 policy of life insurance. And we didn't know that he canceled the premiums on it and it lapsed. And when he died suddenly and unexpectedly, um, it left my, my mother-in-law up the Creek without a paddle. And so my husband and I took it upon ourselves because we were going to be moving closer to them anyway, to put ourselves in financial jeopardy to go down to take care of her because she was about to be homeless. And had he had just kept up with it, it would have been a very, very different scenario. So tell us a little bit, Stephen, what exactly is life insurance? Because I remember thinking as a kid, why, why do I need insurance on my life? That's just silly. <laughs> well, it, it relates to the it relates to the theme of this particular program you're running right now. It is an act of love. Mm -hmm. Okay. Life insurance in the big picture, in the world of finance, you have insurance and investments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're on the insurance side of the ledger. In the world of insurance, you have car insurance and home insurance and liability insurance and on and on and on medical insurance. Okay. And you have life insurance. Um, life insurance is unique in the world of insurance for a number of reasons. The first one is that it doesn't benefit you, the insured. Everything else does. You get medical insurance, it pays your medical bills and on and on and on. Okay. Life insurance is for the benefit of your family or your business or your favorite charity. Okay. So it, it's very much an act of love. Um, meaning that these are people to whom these are you've dedicated to your family you're dedicated to your business you're dedicated to your church or whatever your favorite charity is and your attitude is the show must go on even if i don't mm -hmm. so they have needs um the loss of you is severe mm -hmm. and the life insurance gets paid to them when you die so that they can live long and prosper yeah okay um there is you might say a selfish component to life insurance um which i think is true which is a legacy mm -hmm. um either die a hero or a bum mm -hmm. now i'm not saying that your father-in-law was a bum mm -hmm. but i'm saying is that when you look at your life and you decide how do i want to be remembered and that is a very key decision to make when you think about your life and you do wills and estates and all the stuff that you need um you have to decide how you want to be remembered yeah and to be a generous loving caring spouse father business owner you know patron of a church so on um is a good legacy to have mm -hmm. and um when and you know i've been with people in their last stage family members and so on um it becomes very, very important to people to, to consider how they are remembered and life insurance helps that become a very good name, mm -hmm. helps you attain a very good name yeah. from the grave. Mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have about life insurance? It's a really good question. Okay. Um, There's several types of life insurance and there's term insurance and there's permanent insurance. Okay. Myth number one is that all you need is term and you invest the difference. No. Um, there are some cases where term insurance is important. And those cases deal specifically when you need insurance coverage for a specified amount of time. You want to cover a 30 year business um, mortgage, or you want to cover a 10 year business loan, things like this, or you have a a partnership agreement to last 15 years, things like this. Okay. There are many other cases where permanent insurance is appropriate. Permanent insurance, mean, permanent insurance means you can guarantee the benefit and the premium for your life. Mm -hmm. Just one that comes to mind is if you have a couple that have a special needs child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
um, unfortunately, that child will not become financially self-sufficient ever. Yeah. That child's going to be always dependent on the parents. So those parents need to have life insurance on their lives for as long as they live. While they're alive, they're taking care of the child. And the child can be 40 and they're taking care of the child. Yeah. When they pass on, there needs to be life insurance paid into a trust and the trustee is going to take care of the child. That's just one of a, many examples about why permanent insurance is needed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I think another myth is that, well, okay, I can buy a term now or I could buy a policy. And if I need more coverage, I'll, I'll always get it later. No, um, you need to preserve your insurability, meaning that um, you can't always assume that you're going to be insurable at a later point. This is not an investment. You can't just say, well, when I have the, you know, maybe next year I'll get some money and I'll buy some. Okay, it's not dependent on finances. Insurability can change. Now, what is insurability? Um, If you've ever, applied for life insurance, or if you're familiar with it, you know, they ask a lot of different underwriting questions, current health, health history, driving record, things like this, family history. Okay. And the insurance underwriter takes a snapshot of your insurability and says, ah, it's going to cost so much money to insure you. Okay. Your insurability can change. How can it change? You could be 33 and healthy now, but if diabetes runs in your family, or if breast cancer runs in your family Mm -hmm. or any one of 20 hereditary diseases runs in your family as you get older they might pop up changing your ability to get coverage Mm -hmm. um you may be a somebody who works remotely now but in 10 years you may get a job that requires foreign travel yeah i had a client that was a buyer for for toys r us and that person traveled to China four times a year. Okay, that was a new job for that person. In a prior job, they didn't have to travel overseas, especially to China. Yeah. Okay, that was an underwriting factor, let me tell you. Oh, man. Um, things like this. So you have to understand that insurability can't be taken for granted. And the a time to buy life insurance is when as young as you are and as healthy as you are. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean you won't be able to get coverage later, even if you have a disease or you have a lifestyle which is more risky, it's going to cost more. So those are that's an additional consideration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are people's biggest hesitations about getting life insurance that you've run into? I think people don't like the idea of dying. Yeah. I think that, um, especially in today's culture, there's a, when I say today's culture, is it distinctly Western? Is it distinctly American? Is it distinctly contemporary? I'm not quite sure. But there's many other cultures that take it for granted. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you buy life insurance because um, people die, babies die. You know, there's a thing. Unfortunately, it's true. Um, you know, I, I had a client that came from the old country in Ireland and, you know, every time she had a new grandkid, she had me buy another policy on the kid because in her frame of reference, infant mortality was a real thing. So, you know, thankfully it's a lot less pervasive now. Um, but there's a lot of causes of death. So, and people don't like to face it. And, and I think that, um, if you look at popular movies, popular TV, things like this, um, death is treated as a sudden accident, unplanned. You know, it's like the fact that people get sick and die or that things happen is um, not really played up. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, things are changing and people are becoming more aware of it. But I think our cultures wanting to put the idea of death and suffering in general under the rug. Mm -hmm. Um, results in people not being conscious enough of the possibility. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that I've heard before, two of them actually, oh, I'll just, I'll take care of it later. I'll put that further on the list and it's just kicking the can down the road. And then that factors into that insurability that you were just talking about. 
And the other thing that I've heard before is, well, I'm afraid to get life insurance because if I talk about death, then I'm going to die. Yeah, there's superstition that that relates to the the discomfort of death. I, I, I get that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some, you know, there's the vet, if you look at the industry data, um, many people are, are not insured or underinsured. And we're even talking about wealthy people. It's not just a problem of the lower class or middle class. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that make really good money. Um, there's a lot of people with a high net worth who are still very uninsured. Mm -hmm. And part of it is superstition, like you're saying, part, but that relates to um, a lack of spiritual or religious um, perspective, I think, which doesn't help them understand death as being part of life. Mm -hmm. They end up being superstitious. I, I think that's true. Yeah. Um, as to the first point you mentioned, I've actually had people die on me in the sense that it's a Friday, Steve, come by Monday, we'll give you an application, heart attack on a Sunday, shovel in snow. That literally has happened. Oh my gosh. Oh man. And this isn't to scare anybody or like I'm not scaring anybody. Super, super, super sense of urgency. But this is this is real talk, guys. Like this is this is life. This, this is, is life. You know, and I get it. I, I I'm not using scare tactics. And you know, I think one of the things I that feeds into what you're saying and feeds into the um people delaying getting coverage is the tendency in the and particularly in the financial world to treat everything as a transaction i could you know if i don't invest today i can invest tomorrow if i don't you know um life insurance the purchase of life insurance is not a transaction uh, because it ignores the realities of the hazard life insurance protects against a hazard over which you assert very little control yeah do your push-ups take your vitamins you know do the stuff you got to do um but with all the causes of death, there's many beyond your control. Mm -hmm. So um, you have a lot of control, for instance, over avoiding a car accident by not driving your car. You know, things like this. Um, you can avoid a lawsuit, you know, by following rules, things like this. But you can't push off death. You can turn odds somewhat in your favor by how you live and how you eat and, and what your mindset is like. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's a lot you don't control and and to treat it as a transaction ignores the reality of the hazard yeah so and people you know i even have an online purchasing platform just for people that want to use it okay um those that is pervasive and and i think it kind of dulls people to the um why they're buying insurance in the first place yeah to protect against hazards of which you don't control yeah Exactly, exactly. So Stephen, how much insurance would you recommend that people have for coverage? You mentioned some people either don't have insurance or don't have enough insurance. There's not a cookie cutter formula. You know, you go to these online calculators, five to 10 times salary, I get it, I get it, I get it. That's a good benchmark, okay. But you have to understand there's, that people buy life insurance for many reasons. Mm -hmm. Those online calculators typically help you decide how much money you should leave a surviving spouse and family. Okay. Um, and it's not initially a mathematical problem. It's an emotional problem. Meaning when I have a conversation with folks and, and, and I go to him and you know, how much coverage do you want to leave her? Well, she should be okay with, 10 times my salary, then my question to her is, okay, let's talk the tough talk. You are alone now. You've lost the most important person in your life and you have two kids. What are you gonna do? You're gonna remarry right away? You're gonna get a job right away? You know, I got my life together. I, my kids, they need me. They've already lost one parent. I don't want them losing another one to two jobs, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So the real question is how much time does a surviving spouse need to grieve and mourn and get their act together and assume some direction? Yeah. Two years, three years, five years, 10 years? They should be given the amount of time 
they need to do this. And that's how you kind of back into how much money you leave them. Yeah. You know, people are different. Women are different. Men are different. Some people say, I'll be, too, I'll be remarried in two years. Okay, fine. I will never remarry. Okay, that's also a factor. Okay, These, this, so it's a really a family planning um, question mm -hmm. that and you, you need to have that kind of conversation. And that's how you back in into an amount. Yeah. It's for, life insurance is for the survivor. So let's take into account the survivor's needs. Really, that's the way it should be done. Yeah. Now, there are other reasons why people buy life insurance. You want to cover a 30-year mortgage of 500,000. So that's easy. You know, how much? Okay. You want to cover a business loan for $500,000, a 10-year loan? Okay. You know, so you, the point is different needs for insurance call for different types of policies, different amounts. Okay. That's how you figure it. And the fact is that people often buy two or three or four policies. One will be the surviving family. One will be to cover the business loan and, and on and on and on. So that's how you develop a life insurance portfolio by looking at all the different needs and figuring how much coverage is need, needed for how long. Yeah, yeah. I've got clients who are debt free. They know how to manage their money. They've got a big nest egg. And I also have clients who have 10 multi million dollar business that should something happen to the owner, like that's it, that's all she wrote. So yeah. absolutely, I love that you take a holistic approach to it. You ask those questions. You, I'm like, I remember when we first met in our first conversation, you were asking me, okay, how much do you have left to pay on your house? How much uh, is your husband's um, income? How much is, and all that stuff. Like, so you approach it from the holistic level, not just like you said, that cookie cutter, because everybody's needs is different. Yeah. So I know this might be a silly question, but who should have life insurance? You know, everybody should have life insurance. Okay. I remember when I, when I first entered the business on a full-time basis in the nineties, it was a big deal that Malcolm Forbes, you know, of the Forbes empire, he bragged, you know, there's an article about him. He goes, I got so much life insurance, you wouldn't believe. And people are like, really? Why do you need life insurance? He goes, why? Because I'm a really rich guy. And I know that when I die, Uncle Sam's going to want to take a huge part of my assets as an as a state tax. And frankly, I don't want my, my heirs having to sell my business empire just to pay Uncle Sam. So I'll buy life insurance, so life insurance will pay Uncle Sam, and I'll keep my assets intact, my business, my house, my fortune, this and that. Okay. Um, now, let's go down to the other end of the spectrum. Um, you're, you're not Malcolm Forbes, and you're getting by type of thing. Um, what, what happens if, you know, do you still need life insurance? Well, same question. What would happen if you died? You know, a lot of people will say, I'm going to scrimp and save it. I'm going to get money for life insurance because I don't want my survive, my wife or my husband to go on welfare. Yeah. Why would the government take care of my, my, my wife and kids? Mm -hmm. You know, so, okay. So there you have it, according to income, everybody. Yeah. Now, um, adults, many reasons. Children, absolutely. You want two reasons why children should have life insurance? I'll give you two. Um, I have many clients, and this is actually especially popular among diabetics for some reason. Mom has diabetes, and um, she's concerned that when her kids get older, they're also going to get diabetes, type 2 diabetes, adult onset. Mom had a lot of trouble getting life insurance, but we got it for her. And she's like, I don't want my daughter to go through this. It's too expensive. So you, you buy life insurance on a kid, two years old, three years old, four years old. And now the, and, the, and that's insurance on the child. Yeah. So when the child becomes of age, mature, and gets married, family, mortgage, whatever else, that child is already insured yeah. at a really good rate. So unfortunately, the child doesn't get a hereditary disease or becomes a mountain climber or becomes a, a purchasing agent for Toys or Us, and they go to me and say, what's the rate? It's going to be high. They have life insurance. Yes. Okay. The other, so yeah, life insurance on a child. The other reason is that, that with the right policy, 
with the right company, it could, it could build a heck of a lot of cash on a guaranteed basis. And a lot of financial planners like the guaranteed cash of life insurance to be the conservative part of their investment portfolio. Mm -hmm. If you let it ride, historically, it makes a bunch of money. And these days, these days, it outperforms what's going on in the, in the, in the bond place, the marketplace, and so on. So those are two reasons why even kids should have life insurance. Yeah. And even, even spouses who aren't working should have it too. Because let's just say you have this stay-at-home mom who chooses that her job is going to be to raise her kids, which is a full-time job without pay. Yeah. yeah. If she were to die, like those kids are going to need childcare. And we know that's not cheap. Those kids are going to need a means to be able to go to college if that's their choice. Like, right. That's, that's not cheap. Like just because you might not necessarily bring in an income, you've still got to get life insurance. You've still got to want to make sure that that last act of love is to make sure that your spouse and your kids are financially stable. That's true. I've said that to guys. I said, you like your job? Yeah. I said, would you leave your job? No, I, don't, I like my job. What happens if your wife dies? Uh, are you going to want to leave your job? No. Well, then you need to hire Mary Poppins. You need money to hire Mary Poppins. But there are some guys, and also women too, they say, no, I want to be with my kids. Okay, now you need life insurance to replace the income that you're, for, that you're foregoing to be a stay-at-home dad or yeah. a stay-at-home mom. You know? So no matter how you cut it, mm -hmm. the, the parent that had been the at-home taking care of the kid's parent, um, that person needs to be replaced. You need money to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Stephen, one of the reasons why I truly enjoy working not only with you, but also with your company is because your specialty is insuring people that are harder to insure. So tell us a little bit about that, because I know that like in our instance, for example, like we've been in a position where we've been denied life insurance before. So tell us about your process and what makes your company different. Thank you. Yeah, um, it relates to what I mentioned earlier as far as growing up in my father's agency. Um, he, interestingly, was the first, if not one of the first, um, brokers to specialize in the harder cases. We're going back 70 years. Okay. Um, he had a very simple way of doing it. There are some carriers that make small products where there's no underwriting or very simple underwriting. Small face amount, you know, the premium's a little bit high, but not too high. So he went to a lot of agents for companies and said, look, if you're, whoever the company is, Mass Mutual or John Hancock, whoever it is, if your parent company will not take an insured go to me, I have a company that will, it'll be a small amount of coverage, but at least everybody, he'll have coverage. Okay. When I got into the business in 91, I kind of followed that tradition, but I said, you know, really, it's really a question of sometimes those smaller guaranteed issue policies aren't efficient, aren't sufficient to take care of a family or a business, you know, people who are considered higher risk because of a medical condition or a lifestyle, they, if they need a bunch of insurance for a long time, they should be able to get it without paying an arm and a leg. Okay, so that's when the hunt started. But the hunt started to find out what makes the life insurance industry work and how is it possible for people that are higher risk to get coverage. And th there's a few things you find out when you kind of take the lid off the industry. Okay, one is that um, as a general rule, different companies tend to be aggressive at underwriting different types of risks. Um, why is that? It's because like one company may have a director of underwriting who's a cardiologist. You know they're gonna be pretty aggressive in the heart cases because they have, a, they have a huge database, they have a good experience with people that have heart ailments, okay, as opposed to cancer, okay. That's the company you go to for those cases. Okay. Just another example is there used to be a company in this industry um, with a president who was a pilot. He had a pilot's license and he flew to all the business meetings. 
Okay, you can bet that they gobbled up all the cases of insureds who themselves were private pilots. Okay, so depending on the in-house underwriting expertise and familiarity with, with you know, at least some of the underwriting factors, you go to these, this company versus this company. And you need to know who they are. I need to have relationships with them. Okay, number two factor is that contrary to common misconception, companies want that kind of business. They have underwriting manuals which say, okay, we'll take a diabetic or we'll take somebody, well, you know, we might charge a little extra money, but we'll take them. Okay, why will they take them? Okay, um, that's when I came up with pre-qualification, which means that when somebody represents any kind of risk, in particular, a higher risk, we will get thorough and accurate underwriting information about the risk they present and go to those underwriters that might want that risk and say, here it is. Here's what you need to know so you can be comfortable assessing the cost of insuring this person. Please give us a rate now. And we'll go back to the client and say, good, here's what it's going to cost. Now you know you won't get declined. It'll be worthwhile applying. Okay. So, so the underwriter likes that because their, their nightmare is not being told everything, not having the client go through full disclosure, not disclosing the heart business. They find out an underwriting after they spend a few thousand dollars trying to underwrite the person. Then they find out, then the costs go through the roof. Then the insurance says, forget about it. And nobody wins. Yeah. Okay. So if you pre-qualify, then you set the stage for everybody to win because you, 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 know, you know in advance what the rate should be. The client is confident in applying. The underwriter knows he's going to get a business. Everybody's going to get what they want. So pre-qualification seals the deal. Um, so those are the two things, industry intelligence about who wants the business and being able to pre-qualify so that we, we understand which company will give us a competitive and reliable rate and the consumer can, is confident going forward. Um, I will add to this by telling you that you mentioned declined before. Mm -hmm. The number one reason why people get declined is because they applied with the wrong company. Yeah. Because the broker, whoever, didn't have the intelligence knowing this company wants this risk, this company wants that risk. Mm -hmm. So when I come across somebody who's been declined and I find out who it was and for what reason, and I go to the, that company, I say, of course, you know, they declined. You know, they're never going to take that case. We all know that. Yeah. Okay. So it's not necessarily a deal breaker going forward. You just have to account for what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm hearing is, is even if you've been declined for life insurance before, there's hope. You just got to do it the right way. You got to get pre-qualified. Yeah, that's exactly right. People are concerned and I respect that. So, so pre-qualification makes it safe and yet effective to shop the, the water, the market again, because pre-qualification is unofficial. It's an unofficial inquiry. You're not submitting a formal application, therefore there's no record of it. So if an underwriter ba basically says, sorry, uninsurable at this time, there's no official record of it. Yeah. So you don't get declined again, um, but you do get a reliable number. The, if, a, if an underwriter is interested, it's a real number, so yeah, Assuming you're giving me everything I need to know, this would be the rate. Yeah. So, so you get your cake and eat it too. You don't risk any official inquiry, but you do get a real number that you can bank on and give you the courage you need to go forward. That is such a big difference in the process then that we went through. We went through all, all the different questions. We went through the blood test and the height and the weight and all of that stuff and the medical history and the family history. And then it just, it does something in your heart when it says you're not worth being insured. I get that. Just don't take it that personally. You know, <laughs> it, you know, you know seriously, it's, it's a, it was not properly handled. It's not a, it's not a full assessment of who you are. Yeah. It, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a cursory, a cursory assessment. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I was going to say something else, but yeah, okay. So, Stephen, how can people get connected with you for their life insurance needs? 
stephencobrin.com, S-T-E-V-E-N-K-O-B-R-I-N.com. That's our business site, and um, it'll really tell the tale very well about what we do and how we do it. Contact information, um, I, I will get involved, and we really want to be able to help people. Yeah, yeah. And folks, Stephen is the people that I refer my people to, whether they be combat veterans or people who have the diabetes or business owners who have that multi-million dollar business. Steven is the person that I personally trust for those life insurance needs. A, because he's good people. B, he truly has the heart of a teacher and isn't just sniffing around for a paycheck. And three, his results truly speak for themselves. So Steven, is there anything that you would like to add? No, I, I, I appreciate being here. I, 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 I feel blessed by your words and I'm very grateful for them. Uh, I, um, I believe in life insurance and I know the importance of this product. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're just thinking about it or have any doubts, let's talk because um, I, I really feel it's important to understand that this product is the basis of their financial and emotional security. Mm -hmm. And if they can get it right, then they could build a really good portfolio on top of that and be very successful without the, without the foundation being pulled out from underneath it. Yes. Because the death of a loved one will kill a family or a business. So if you protect that, you're secure. Yes. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining Tracy's Tuesday Talks today. It truly has been an honor. And I will see everybody next week. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Thank you.